Well, let's, let's pray, shall we? Father, as we uh, come into your word this morning, we pray that you would guide us into your truth. You would lead us by your spirit. You would encourage our hearts and help us to fall more in love of you and help us to love others well. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning to you all. Um, you guys are the ones who didn't go camping on a long weekend. And as you look outside the doors, congratulations. A good decision making skills there. Uh, far too wet. Uh, my name is Hayden. Uh, for those who might not know me, I'm one of the pastors around here. Uh, Rodney describes himself as the American one uh, who talks fast. So I'll describe myself as the tall Australian one. Yeah, does that work? If it doesn't, you might be taller than me and Rodney, um, which isn't hard, uh, to be fair. Uh, this morning, we're, we're taking a bit of a break uh, through from our Galatian series, where we're going to be having a look um, at a familiar story um, from the book of Matthew. We're doing this for the school holidays, because it's nice having a bit of a break for the school holidays, look at some different topics, and to cleanse our palate from Galatians, we've been working verse by verse. Uh, and the story we're going to be looking at in the book of Matthew is on the parable of the lost sheep. A very familiar story, uh, which addresses a problem that we're probably all very well familiar with as well, Christians treating other Christians badly. But before we get into that parable, I first uh, want to tell you a story about a girl called Joy. Now, Joy isn't a real person, um, but she might as well be, because uh, I've heard her story plenty of, plenty of times over my walk as a Christian, and I thought this morning, perhaps you might be able to relate Joy had uh, grown up in a, a kind of Christian environment. She had been around Christians for seasons of her life um, until one day God really kind of struck her heart. Uh, the good news about Jesus really hit her. So she placed her faith in Jesus. So she wanted to become a Christian and follow Jesus. And she was excited. Uh, she had never known such a sturdy love in her life. Uh, she had never known such forgiveness and acceptance. Uh, and uh, with a bit of knowledge she knew about Jesus, she, she knew him to be her joy and her hope. What was also exciting for Joy was the community that came with Jesus as well. She quickly joined a church so she could learn more about Jesus. She probably thought that would be a good idea, and that's what she did. And, and what she did when she found this church, they discovered they were actually nice, which is good. Not only had she found a nice savior, but she'd found a nice community. Um, they actually all called each other family. She could walk up to someone and say, oh, that's my brother, that's my sister, that's my aunt and uncle and grandparents and all the works of the place. She felt safe. Safe. It was nice. They were a bit different, though, and did kind of hung out in different ways she thought might be potentially a bit boring. Uh, but it was much nicer than what she had before, which really wasn't much. For the first, first little while, Joy was caught up with the joy of finding her saviour, finding this community. But it soon dawned on her, though, after a little while, that she was feeling a little bit left out of things. She knew she didn't need to be a part of everything. She was new after all, and people have their friends. Uh, but soon enough, she did kind of realize some patterns. She felt a, a few cold, cold shoulder from some people who, who were at the beginning pretty nice. Over time, Joy found that the people she, some people she kind of connected with, which was good, but she only really could connect well with them. It was hard to kind of break in further, and others really started making it clear that she wasn't really worth their time or day, uh, that they didn't really like her, and some of the things she did or the way she acted and made it clear that she wasn't really up to their level or ability or humor or skill or social status. That she clearly, clearly wasn't one of them. Eventually, she took the hint. After by chance meeting a few Christians at a random event, she decided to go check out their church. Maybe she might fit in better there. After all, Jesus is still good. She, it might just be that church. Well, hopefully, anyway. Joy had found joy in Jesus, but had found his community not to be the, the best experience. Maybe you can relate that Relate to that yourself, because others sure do. In uh, 2017, the uh, McCrindle Institute did a research into the faith and belief of Australia. You can see it on the screen there. Um, what they discovered, it wasn't whether church is seen as a place full of rules or, or a place that was a little, bit, a little bit irrelevant or outdated that kind of led people having a negative view of Christianity. What they discovered was that it was how Christians treat their own and their integrity. 
whether our walk matches our talk. What makes up a massive chunk of why someone has a bad view of Christianity in Australia is the top four are church abuse, religious wars, hypocrisy, and judging others. And while some of those do involve people outside of Christianity, a lot of it has to do with how we treat our own. A lot of it has to do with how we treat those within our own ranks. And I'm sure there's some here this morning who don't really need to hear the statistics about that because you've lived that yourself, yeah? Because you've personally experienced it. You've personally experienced maybe Christians looking down on you or treating you as nothing maybe or devaluing you. You've been in situations like joy before. Whether it's because you're old or young or maybe a little bit overweight or not having the right likes or the amount of spirituality, I'm sure you can relate. This morning, we're going to look at a, a simple truth, and it is this, that God deeply values us. God deeply values us. And the emphasis is on the us, because it's not just for the few. God deeply values us. Which leads me to my second story this morning. We're going to be looking at it from Matthew 18, 10 to 14. So get your Bibles open and we'll, re- we'll read it all together. All right. It goes like this. Oh, I'm in the wrong section. That's a bit awkward, isn't it? There we go. <laughs> Matthew 18, verse 10 to 14. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, most of us here will be familiar with the story that we've read this morning about the lost sheep. But not many of us would realize that the story we find in Matthew, in Matthew's account of the lost sheep, is actually about God seeking out Christians who are lost. The one in Luke is about lost unbelievers. The one in Matthew is actually about lost Christians. Uh, For those who find this a little bit weird, pretty much every TV show and movie and video game at the moment is a reboot, right? Because they found a good story once, they're not creative anymore, and so they've just rebooted the same thing. Surely one of the greatest storytellers in the world, Jesus, think about it, half of his analogies and parables are all in our common language. Surely he can use some of the same old material, right? If it's a good story, why waste it? And for this reason, he kind of used it in multiple different settings. And the reason we know that this is more about believers being lost rather than unbelievers is because of the actual, the context that it's in. Uh, right now in this story, in chapter 18, we're, we're dealing with a context where Jesus is chatting to his disciples about children, about humility, and how we actually treat each other as believers. He, he had early, answered earlier in the chapter a famous question by the disciples, the question of who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And what he did was he gathered in a child and he pointed at it and said, this one. What he was highlighting was that those who come from a place of humility reach out to Jesus. It's a humbling thing to believe in Jesus because you have to reach out on him to depend upon him. You have to reach out on him trusting him, not your own good works or anything like that. And so we should be humble as Christians, like children who depend upon others and know they need others to help them get through. You might be surprised, kids in the room, that adults forget this. Well, kids at times may get in trouble for saying mum, 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 over and over and over again. And then just saying that makes me feel a little bit annoyed, irritated, because they want something. We get in trouble as adults because we forget to ask help in the first place. How arrogant of us, I think. We came into this world dependent on other people and dependent on God, and surely we will continue in the same way. So Jesus points out that Christians should be humble. Knowing their dependence, knowing that they are the biggest and the best, but God is. Jesus carries on the thought in a number of different directions in, in chapter 18, in particular on how we treat each other and on sin, until he gets to verse 10, where while he once spoke about children, he now speaks about Christians in general and calls them his little ones, because this humility is what defines them. And speaking of them, he tells this Christian community not to despise these little ones, as in each other, and gives them two reasons for it. 
But before we get to those reasons, let's have a look at two words from verse 10 there. See and despise. Starting with despise. Despise is a, a very serious word, isn't it? You don't really hear too many kids saying, I despise you in language. It's a very serious, very proper word. It, it means not to like someone. When you, see, uh, when you say you despise someone, you, you don't like them. But it also has an element of looking down on them as well. Not seeing their worth, devaluing them, disrespecting them. And so to despise someone is to look at them for they lack value and, and not like them for it. Now, all of us would think to ourselves, I would never do something like that. That's completely far off from me. Definitely not. But that's, that's really what's interesting about the word see here in verse 10, what Jesus uses. What, in the Greek, as you look at it, the, what's being communicated here is that Jesus is telling those who are hearing him to make a concentrated effort not to despise one of these little ones. Put some effort into it. Realize this might actually be a problem for you around Christians and avoid it. You might maybe relate to the idea of being one who's a little bit more left out of things or being treated as someone who's not worth as much. But Jesus puts forward that the problem and those who cause it might actually be a little bit wider than we initially expected. It might actually even include you. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, Jesus says. And then he gives us two reasons for it, which we're going to have a look at right now. First one is this, Matthew 18.10. For I tell you in heaven that angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And it's reason number one. Now, historically, this verse has been used to kind of defend the idea of um, guardian angels, as in each person has their angel or each kid has their angel kind of protecting them. I'm I'm not entirely convinced myself. I'm convinced that angels are involved in human affairs. When we look at the book of Daniel, they seem to be involved in big nations. We look at the beginning of the book of Matthew and they're involved sending messages to people. We look in the book of Revelation, there seems to be angels with churches. And we look in Hebrews uh, 1.14, talks about the idea of angels ministering to believers in general. Uh, But it never seems to be really one angel per one person. Uh, It always seems to be one angel kind of ministering to more. So this, this verse seems a little bit out of step if we interpret it as, as a guardian angel. But at the same time, I will say, we don't know much about angels and demons in the Bible. God didn't really give us too much details. So, you know, that's just what I think. Take it or leave it. Uh, what we do know from these verses, though, is that God so cares for Christians that he uses his angelic forces to bring the situations of believers before his face. As in, which is an expression of having access to God, right? As in, the angels have access to God and they bring what is going on in your life to God. Think about this for a second. In Christianity, we often think about the idea and talk about the idea that we have a a personal relationship with God. Do you realize how personal that actually is? The high king of heaven, the creator of everything, with more splendor than the king of our lands, so deeply values you that he personally knows and is interested in knowing what is going on in your life. It's a handy thing if you've ever talked to someone and their eyes glaze over as you're sharing your day. When King Charles took the throne on recently, you'll see a picture come up on the screen, uh, he, uh, they released a photo of him doing his official duties. Um, in that photo is the famed red box. You can see it just down here on the, on the bottom right here with a couple documents in it. That document, uh, that red box, uh, if you've seen photos of Queen Elizabeth II, it's in a lot of different photos. It's, it's what they use to kind of bring in all the important documents that a royal needs to look into. Things from the United Kingdom, across the Commonwealth, and everything like that. To make that red box, those important documents that require a kingly gaze uh, would be pretty significant. After all, this this king, our new king, is the head of the Commonwealth, which has 2.5 billion people. Not million, billion. That's a big responsibility. He's also the head of state for 14 countries along with the UK, including Australia. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of countries. To make that bed red box, you better hope it's for a good reason, right? Uh, to be under here, that king's gaze would be huge. How much more so for the king of the universe? For the creator of all things to make his red box, to be under his gaze. 
And yet we are. God knows intimately each one of us. He knows his little ones. He knows what is going on in their lives. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows their wants and dreams, their frustrations, their aches and hurts, and their deep fears. He knows, he considers, and he sees. Do you realize that is true of you? Sometimes it feels as if God is far away, doesn't it? You may feel like you're at the bottom of the red box, never seeing the light of day. You can kind of feel like that friend who you're talking to kind of gets a bit distracted by their phone um, or what's going on in the background. If you're a parent like me, you're kind of always watching out for your kids. And I, I do feel bad sometimes when I'm talking to people. I am listening. I'm trying. You might feel so little that you don't really feel seen. But nothing could be farther from the, for the case. In these verses, we see these, the issues that we have in our lives are actually brought right in front of God's eyes. He sees you in the truest sense of all, and he knows what is going on. But not only does he know what is going on, do you see in verse 10 that he also sees what is going on as a father would see someone? And here we see that Jesus is claiming that God is his father, which reminds us that he is also our father. And any good dad does not only just see, but he also cares. And the same is said of our heavenly father. As we see in Exodus 34, verse 6, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That was what was revealed to us about God to Moses. That is our God. That is our father. It takes much to anger him and very little for him to show mercy. Isn't that a great truth? You have a special, intimate relationship with a merciful and loving father. That is why no Christian should despise you, because you were valued by God himself, a loving father. God deeply values you. Now, this way may be well and good. Knowing God deeply values you should be something we treasure and store down deep and let it change our hearts and minds. But the real question we often have lurking underneath, though, is will he value us even when we go through hard times? When we stuff up? It's one thing to say that we should care for people because God cares for them. But does God still care for us and expect others to care for you when we're not on the path we should be? When you're lost? Well, that takes us to the second reason this morning, why we shouldn't despise other Christians. Jesus gives a second reason. It's in uh, verse 12. It goes like this. He tells a parable. What do you think? Which is a big signal for putting your thinking caps on. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? Imagine with me, if you will, a man called John. John has been a shepherd his whole life. He's looked after other people's sheep. He's looked after his own sheep. And John's a smart guy. He, he knows the time. It's a good season. He's got 100 sheep. That's, that's good. That's a good amount of money. He could provide for his family pretty well. That's a good amount of wool. That's a good amount of food. You can pretty much use a sheep for anything. It's good for lots of things, right? The problem, though, with sheep, if you've dealt with sheep, is that they eat like there is literally no tomorrow. They'll just keep on going. You've got to move these things around or they'll starve to death or they'll drink up all the water. You've got to keep on them moving. So John has to keep every day getting an idea what's going on and shift them around the place. Not only that, sheep look very tasty to some people. Well, not people, I suppose. Well, some people, I suppose, but more so animals, right? And John has to keep a really good eye on the sheep to making sure they're not gobbled up by other things. He has to keep a careful count because sheep end up getting lost. They kind of get stuck, and if they get stuck, who knows what's going to happen to them. He's raised these sheep, these hundred sheep. He, they depend upon him for their life, and he cares for them. If one day John was counting his sheep and realized that one was missing, not again, would he, would he not go out and leave the 99 in one kind of spot and go and search for these sheep? This sheep and his sheep are part of his, his livelihood. Now, we may be tempted to think, okay, that's one sheep out of 99. That's, that's a pretty good acceptable loss, right? One sheep out of 99. Yep, I get that. But I think that's because we don't value sheep like John does. We don't value sheep enough. 
Jesus says that man would go out and find that sheep, his sheep, and bring it back to look after. Make sure it's okay, fed, back in the herd. If sheep ended up trouble, that shepherd would go out and act, change his whole routine, and take the effort, the concentrated effort, to go out and look for it, to bring it about, and continue to do so. And what would happen if he found it? Would he kick it, scream it, you mongrel sheep? What did you do that for? Throw it back in the herd? No. What would he do? He would rejoice over it. More than the 99 that never went astray, that never went, got, got lost because he found his sheep. It's very exciting to find your sheep. As Jesus explains in Matthew 18, 14, so it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God is not willing to lose any sheep. He is not willing to let them perish. In John 6, 39 to 40, Jesus says this, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should not lose, uh, should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. God is at work to keep his sheep safe. And if that is how much God cares for one single sheep, that he's willing to leave the 99 over there at at some risk, seemingly going against a bit of the ethics we have today, going looking after one and leaving the 99 at risk, how could anyone despise his sheep? How could anyone despise you? You are worth the effort according to God. You're worth looking for according to God. You are worth rejoicing over according to God. And why? Well, it's not because you've done anything. In this parable, who was the one who got themselves lost? It was the sheep, wasn't it? But what does the shepherd do? He rejoices over it when he finds it. Not saying he isn't happy with all the other sheep that stayed where they should have. No, he is, but he is particularly happy when he finds this one, as you would be after finding something finally that you value. God's value for you is there in the good and the bad. If you're curious, it will stay in the bad. These verses are here to smack you in the face. He will look for you. He will not give up and count you as a lost. He will keep on moving. He will look for you because God deeply values you. He even tells you in your wondering. When I was 19, I uh, knelt beside my bed uh, and prayed for forgiveness. I uh, grew up as a Christian and became a Christian, I think when I was 10. Um, and I tried to live after that. I tried to live a life that I thought would be some sort of good life that really didn't involve God. But I only kind of, I only really got more and more lost. The food was bad. It felt dark. And the more I tried, the more I realized I wasn't the solution. In fact, I was part of the problem. And so I prayed for forgiveness because I knew that I needed forgiveness. And I knew that God would give it freely. I needed to get back on the right paths again. It did bring me joy at once. When I was 19, I was found by my shepherd less than a kilometer from here. But you know what was interesting as I look back? I can see all the different times that God did things in my life and brought around the right people, and had the right people there. Three people come to mind in particular. One, when I was a teenage boy, I I lived in North Queensland. One person that comes to mind is my pastor from that time. We're part of a small little church plant. This guy was a busy man. He worked full time. He was helping plant a church. But he gave me the opportunities to hang out with him, have fun, and get to know me, uh, even though he was so busy, and made it clear that I could come to him, even when I was off doing silly things. The other person who comes to mind during those years was my youth leader. That guy had a knack, I can't remember much of what we said, but he had a knack of making me feel okay and welcome. That if I went off and did something, I know that I could call him. If I got into trouble, he would come and help me out. He cared for me, no matter what I was doing. And the other person who comes to mind during those years was my sister. I love my sister greatly. She would bring me to church the times when I would allow her to bring me to church. She would love me and she would care for me. She'd give me books and say I should read them. She would challenge me and most of all, she would pray constantly for me. All these people still loved me during those years. They didn't despise me even in my wanderings because God didn't. Because God even goes after the lost sheep. God deeply values 
you. But there is a flip side though, isn't it? If you know that you have a special relationship with God, then you should know that that is also true of others. If you know that you are a prized sheep, you should know that God has other sheep too. Because God isn't just, doesn't just deeply value you, he deeply values us. And God didn't just address this parable to some, he addressed this parable to all of us. Because to put it plainly, Jesus knew that we would all struggle not to despise other Christians. We all have been contributors at times in a story like Joy's. And it's almost incomprehensible that we would. We would never, never carelessly go in and break someone else's precious jewelry. We wouldn't find someone's hard drive we know full of precious photos and wipe it. We wouldn't go over and, you know, take someone's pet and sell it off. But we despise other Christians. Okay, maybe some of you might take someone else's pet and sell it off, but that's the spot. That's beside the point. We despise other Christians who God deeply values. Whether that's an inner sigh that we make, oh, not this person again. Or hiding from people so you don't have to play or talk with them. Or putting someone at the bottom of your list so that they never see the time of day. Or avoiding people when they're going through struggles because you just, you just can't deal. Or that deliberate lack of attention when someone is talking because you're so above the conversation. We have all looked down on others at times. We have all despised others. And it's not okay. Not for the joys out there in the world, who may be still going from church to church to find a place where they fit in finally. Not to us when we feel like a joy in our own lives. And not to those who God deeply values. So, what should we do? How can we be a community that is actively seeing to it that we do not despise others? And the first, first thing is this. I've got three things which come from the story. The first thing is this. Get your height right. Because it is important that Jesus describes us as his little ones in this story. Because being humble solves a multitude of problems in life. If we truly feel humble, how can we bring it upon ourselves to think little of someone else? To look down on others. If you are the shortest in the room, you do not look down on other people. It just doesn't work that way. We need to start acting like the kids in the room today. We need to be humble knowing our dependence, knowing our size, knowing we need others. We need to become like children, as Jesus would say. And as a side note, some of our kids at this church are great. I'm very proud of them. I think we should probably be like them in other ways too. That's, a, that's another point. The second point that comes up of how we can not despise others from the story is we need to remember that God deeply values us and not just you. Let's face it, we know that people are annoying at times, all right? People repeat the same story over and over again, or sometimes they're a bit smelly and have bad breath, or they may be a bit of a know-it-all or a bit arrogant, or they're just not that interesting. And they're all not that interested in the same things as you. It can be pretty hard to get along with some people. It's hard to get along with someone when they do look down on you and are arrogant towards you, or they do things which you just consider really weird and really foolish. But when we attempted to not give someone the time of the day, to look down on them in those cases, to ignore them, to hide from them, to go to the other side of the hall, give them the cold shoulder. Remember that God gives you both the time of day, that he thinks of you both, that both of you make the red box, that both of you are cared for, that he sends angels to minister to you both. He, know, he both knows your ins and your outs because God deeply values us us and not during the good times only it's also for the times when people start acting in ways you know they know better and thinking in ways you just aren't a fan of god still values us then god deeply values us to help us not despise others we need to remember how much he values us and that may be a very simple Simple understanding, simple point, a part of your Christian walk. But I will say, the fact that this is still an issue for 2,000 years in the church history probably means it's not simple enough. 
He deeply values us. Let that sink in deep. And thirdly, to help us not despise others, we need to remember what our shepherd is like. When we think and are critical about other people, we can kind of have memories which go through our minds, right? Whether it's the person you might have hurt the feelings of once before or opportunities lost or the I should have done this or that or I could have done more. The rest of the chapter 18 kind of deals with some of those emotions and how to deal with conflict and all sorts of things like that. But rather, I want you to, I want to draw your eyes to your shepherd this morning as our last point. Because we've all been at times despising, judgmental, wandering sheep. Forgetting our humble place, we've wandered off into paths that have been high and mighty, that have been disrespectful, associating only those we deem worthy enough to associate with. But God doesn't give up on his sheep. He doesn't give up on us. He seeks them out and he rejoices over them when they're found. So if you find this passage this morning a bit convicting in how you treat others, don't be afraid to turn and ask for forgiveness from this sheep, from this sheep, shepherd, I should say. He stands leading us all to mercy and grace, to better pastures. Join him, cling to him, learn from his humility because he is eager to guide you in a better way as every good shepherd is. In fact, he promises to be at work inside of you as well as guiding you externally so that you will love like he loves and value like he values, which is really handy when you talk to people around you have particular trouble with. Have faith in that moment. Pray to God, give me the strength because he's promised to be there with you in it. It's a simple prayer. Please, God, help me talk to this person. That's all we have to do. Remember your shepherd. And don't be afraid to approach him. His mercy is pent up and ready to gush forth. Brothers and sisters in the room today, family in the room today, let's not despise the little ones that are around the place. And let's not despise the little ones outside the doors either. Let's pray. Father, we are... We are humbled by your word in so many ways. We know that at times we have not lived up to your standard. We have treated others poorly. We have treated others unkindly because we have not viewed them as you have viewed them. We have not valued them as you have valued them. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us of our ways. Lead us into your better ways, your better pastures. Help us to see things the way you see things. Help us to love the way you love. Lord, give us strength even today to love well as you love. In Jesus' name, amen.